Hello, friends. Please forgive today's potentially poor sound quality. I am in a Mayan cave of sorts. And before I begin today's story, I need to say thank you to Heine, a lovely listener who correctly pointed out that the name of the man whose burning bakery likely began the Great Fire of London in September of 1666 is Samuel Pepys, and not, as I repeatedly said, Samuel Pepys. Well, at least I never pronounce it Shire, right? <clears throat> so, for a few wonderful weeks, the estate has relocated itself to Quintana Roo, Mexico. And for that reason, I want to tell you a story from local history. First, let me say that, unequivocally, despite what American schools seem to have taught their students in the past, the Mayan people did by no means disappear from the planet some centuries ago. In fact, they are right here, all around me, throughout Quintana Roo and the Yucatan, and even their ancient language is alive and well. Saying that the Mayan people disappeared because their ancient cities are no longer populated is a bit like saying that the Egyptian people are gone because of the crumbling ruins of Memphis and Thebes. The Maya are right here, living in modern cities, towns, and farms, just like the Egyptians. Following contact with Hernan Cortes and the rest of the Spanish conquistadors, it's true that smallpox killed large swaths of Maya and many other native groups here in Mexico and across the Americas, but the people and their culture persevered, even as thousands of them were enslaved or took to the depths of the jungle to escape. By the time of Mexico's independence from Spain in September of 1821, European immigrants and mixed-race mestizos made up a majority of the population of the Yucatan and Quintana Roo, with a huge percentage of native-blooded people such as the Maya trapped as indebted laborers on large haciendas. In 1847, those very Maya began the caste war of the Yucatan. This was a native revolution against the Mexican state, which had lied to them in the creation of the nation and allocated land to hacienda managers to produce sugarcane, textiles, and mined minerals for trade. Called indios by Spaniards, those of Spanish descent, and even mestizos, the Mayas were formerly at the bottom of the Mexican caste system along with African slaves. It was the members of a large sector of the Maya, not fully assimilated or subdued and living for the most part in the East, who led the struggle. They rebelled against the whites, creoles, mestizos, and even assimilated Maya who lived in the area. Not all of the Maya participated in the revolt. For example, Maya in the southern region remained neutral for most of the conflict. In the northern portion of the peninsula, many Maya fought directly against insurgents. The indigenous population was concentrated in the Campeche Merida region. There, Maya roughly outnumbered Latino and Spaniard groups by three to one throughout the Yucatan, but in the east, this ratio was closer to five to one. The elites maintained the strictest discipline and control over the Maya population in the East, backed by, surprise, the Catholic Church. Mayan leader Jacinto Pat wrote to the British in 1848 asking for support in the caste war, stating that, what we want is liberty and not oppression. Governor of the Yucatan, Santiago Mendez, learned that rebel Maya had begun to gather in Pat's land near the city of Valladolid and arm themselves, at which point he marched the Mexican army in their direction. Mendez arrested the rebel military leader Manuel Antonio I and had him hung in the Valladolid Plaza before burning the nearby Maya town of Tepeche and several others in a massacre that lasted several months. By 1850, the Maya occupied two distinct regions in the southeast. In the decade that followed, a stalemate developed, with the Yucatecan government in control of the northwest and the Maya in control of the southeast, with a sparsely populated jungle frontier in between. 
That is when Great Britain decided to respond to the Maya's call for help. In a bid mostly aimed at preventing problems with its nearby dominion of British Honduras, populated by thousands of British Maya citizens. The British would ultimately help protect the independent status of the southern Chan Santa Cruz community of Maya, which bordered British Honduras, but work with the government of Mexico to quash battles further north. The Chan Santa Cruz state, stretching from north of Tulum to the Belize border and a considerable distance inland, was the largest of the independent Maya communities of the era, but not the only one. Jose Maria Echeverria, a sergeant in the army taken captive by the Maya, resided in the town in 1851-53. He reported later that it had about 200 Maya and 200 whites, all well armed and apparently fighting together. The whites were under the commander, who he called a man of reddish complexion. They also had several outlying communities under their control, one contained about 100 people and the others unknown numbers. An English visitor in 1858 thought the Maya had about 1,500 fighting men in all. The Ishkahana Maya community had a population of some 1,000 people who refused the Cruzcom's break with traditional Catholicism. In the years of the stalemate, Ishkahana agreed to nominal recognition of the government of Mexico in exchange for some guns to defend themselves from Cruzob raids and the promise that the Mexican government would otherwise leave them alone. Mexico City gave them autonomy to govern themselves through 1894, following a treaty with the United Kingdom that recognized Mexico's rule over the Yucatan. Negotiations in 1883 led to a treaty signed on January 11th of 1884 in Belize City by a Chan Santa Cruz general and the vice governor of Yucatan. It recognized Mexican sovereignty over the region, formalizing the border between Mexico and British Honduras and closing their colony's border to trade with the Chan Santa Cruz rebels. As Belize merchants were Chan Santa Cruz's major source of gunpowder and guns, this was a serious blow for the independent Maya. Those of Chan Santa Cruz remained actively hostile to the Mexican government well into the 20th century. For many years, any non-Maya who entered the jungles of what is now the Mexican state of Quintana Roo was at risk of being killed outright. The combination of new economic factors, such as the entry of the Wrigley's company Chicle Hunters into the region, and the political and social changes resulting from the Mexican Revolution, eventually reduced the hatred and hostility. In one form or another, war and armed struggle had continued for more than 50 years, and an estimated 40 to 50,000 people died in the hostilities. The war was officially declared over for the final time in September of 1915 by General Salvador Alvarado. Alvarado, sent by the revolutionary government in Mexico City to restore order in Yucatan, became governor of the state and implemented reforms that mitigated grievances that had caused the conflict. Over the course of the following century, the relationship between the Maya and the other ethnic groups that comprise Mexico has significantly softened. Modern Mexico has accepted and learned to celebrate its diverse ethnic roots, especially given the mixture of indigenous, European, and African blood that exists in the vast majority of today's population. In times of peace, Mayans have been able to reconnect with their ancestral roots and find ways to re-establish some traditional rituals. If you visit Quintana Roo today, you can bear witness to such amazing spectacles as the sacred Maya canoe crossing and the dance of the voladores. The sacred Mayan canoe crossing takes place every year in May to commemorate an ancient pilgrimage from the Mexican mainland at Ixcaret to the island of Cozumel. About 300 to 400 handmade canoes are paddled back and forth while rowers and ritual performers dress in traditional clothes and paint. They row to the island for the blessings and messages of the goddess Ixchel, 
then return home to spread those messages. You can see that the canoes are ordered with the dots and lines of the early Maya number system. Many researchers believe that such a pilgrimage was commonplace for women during the peak of the Mayan civilization as a way to receive fertility blessings. The Dance of the Voladores is another incredible spectacle intended to ask the gods for fertile lands and to express harmony with the nature spirits. Four to six voladores, or flyers, climb atop a 30-meter pole for this ritual and expertly wind long ropes around a frame at the top, then attach themselves to the other end. A single volador plays a set of hand drums at the center of the pole, the music building until the others leap out backwards from the frame and twirl towards the ground, the ropes unwinding slowly and guiding them all in a growing circle around the pole. The musician follows them down in a similar manner, and the lands and people are blessed for another year. I've personally witnessed these Mayan rituals in various places along the aptly named Riviera Maya, including Playa del Carmen, Cozumel, and Ishkaret, where the traditional costume and language of such performers blends magically with the ubiquitous remains of hundreds of Mayan temples, pyramids, wells, walls, lighthouses, and other buildings. Ironically, today's Mayan show people make a living from the tourism of fellow Mexicans, North and South Americans, and Spaniards who flock to see them perform every year. As they say, it is not good to remove the first layer of the tortillas or pimples will appear on your face. Be patient, you will have your fill. A quick note on this show's advertising. History Obscura is hosted by Podbean, a company to which I have given permission to broadcast short advertisements from a variety of sponsors. These are currently allowing the show to continue, which is ideal for all of us. I want you all to know that I do not have any idea what ads are running in my episodes, nor when, nor where. I'm not personally endorsing anything. I'm simply allowing Podbean's pre-vetted sponsors to take half a minute to offer you their goods, services, or what have you. Please give them a brief moment of your attention in thanks for keeping the show on the air. If a sponsor really isn't your cup of tea, that's perfectly fine. The story you're here for will return in just a moment. Also, if you really can't be bothered with advertising throughout your podcast listening experience, I'm very happy to announce that you can now sign up as an ad-free aficionado of the show's Patreon, which you can find at www.patreon.com forward slash History Obscura, or by searching for History Obscura using Patreon's search feature. A few dollars a month will give you access to completely ad-free, promo-free episodes as soon as they are released, and I'm working on uploading the entire back catalog as well. All of Season 4 is available as of this broadcast and all new episodes as they are released. Thanks for listening, and thank you for sharing, rating, and following the podcast. We here at The Estate appreciate you. Good night. <laughs>